there are multiple external resources, or excuse me, yeah, resources and dissertations from different people around the world how literally uh, the Egyptians covered the entire world with their seafaring uh, skills. Now remember, the, you, you always think of just Thor Heyerdahl, if anybody's familiar with that, and Contiki, but it's way beyond that. Some of the Chinese, if you will, 2000 BC ships were uh, 110, let's see, 110, uh, just about 410. 10 feet, you know, over 100 meters. And Maui, and this is fascinating, the, the island that Maui is named for was an Egyptian god. All of the totem poles and all of the different, uh, if you will, idols that all these uh, seafarers carried all go back to Egypt. And then in uh, the book that Tom Horn and I wrote together, Cloud Eaters, and again, the Cloud Eaters book, uh, the Cloud Eaters was simply talking about the giants. As you looked up at them, they were so tall that it looked like their heads were in the clouds. Now, no, I can't say it. I was going to say, if you look at modern society, you'd think their heads are someplace else, but I won't say that, okay? <laughs> in other words, uh, yeah, I, I can't say that. But the point is, is that the idea that the Egyptians were in the Grand Canyon, you know, it's a it's a matter of mockery to some, but the point is, there's guys who are, are the, even the Native Americans that trace their lineage to that, and it's not because somebody came over from Egypt, uh, married an, uh, you know, a Native American wife and produced that. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about in the ancient times. So, the idea is that very, very clearly that the caves throughout uh, the United States, the Americas, all of the underground tunnels, all of the different uh, repositories for information, artifacts, the, those things are a matter of record, you know, are, are the, even at the, there was a time when the gold artifacts from King Cave's tunnel were on display in the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian Washington, D.C., uh, you know, it's it's fascinating because one of the artifacts was King Akhenaten and Queen Nefertiri. So the astonishing thing is, is that there was a global draw to the Americas. Now remember, Amaruka, America is called, I'm sorry, America was known as Amaruka to the natives. And that's the land of the plume serpents. So if Atlantis was destroyed, and if uh, the Americas are part of it, or if there are places in America, it still is interesting that to the South American, the Native Americans, they knew this land is the land of the plume serpent. Then you get into the understanding of who the plume serpent was. You get into Quetzalcoatl, Veracocha, uh, Kuku Khan. In essence, it, it goes to the white giants that came from the east. I think Tim, Tim Alberino found probably one of the most remarkable things that's been found in contemporary society as it relates to the uh, Old Testament, where they found literally the, if you will, the, uh, uh, how do I put this nicely, the complaining area that was written in not-so-nice language about Joshua, they were fleeing, the giants were fleeing, Joshua the usurper. And so throughout America, you've got Canaanites, you've got basically a written language called Ogham. You've got the uh, massive understanding or understanding investigation and the uh, ensuing understanding by Barry Fell, who wrote Bronze Age America, Saga America, and America B.C., Harvard trained. You've got too many things stacking up. You've got too many things lining up. So remember this. If you've controlled the narrative for thousands of years, there's a reason you didn't want the truth out. And that, by the way, that's true so many times in pulpits. I can't tell you. People from all over the world say that when they ask, for instance, Derek, their, their pastor to look into this, it's almost like they think, you know, they feel like they're vampires because the pastors, some of them just literally freak out and say, we won't go there, we won't go there. It's because the believers, and by the way, God's got nothing to hide of the truth. If, you know, the point being is, is that all of the believers, if they had understood, if they could have dealt with the root of sin, they wouldn't have uh, reaped the fruit of sin. In other words, it is the beginning of a thing, and that's why Jesus cursed the 
mustard tree, if you will, and said, uh, not the mustard tree, he cursed, and I apologize to everybody, I've been fighting a headache all day. The uh, the tree, what was it, Derek, was it the olive? It's the fig tree. And said, no man tree. eat fruit from me. the, yes. I'm sorry, your fig? fig? Yeah. Yeah, fig tree, okay. The idea, sent, thank you so much, and if I'm a little looking for words, I, I thank those of you who intercede for me on a daily basis. I had to call Romy, I had to call David Langford because that's how bad a headache was. So, again, I'm normally not this struggling for words. So in in the bottom, bottom line, and I've used that word too many times, the idea is simply this. America's history has been covered up to control it, just as the Middle East, just as the Egyptians. And when you've got an Egyptian, basically the president under the king and under the, you know, the Egyptian parliament or their equivalent in the late 1880s, writing to uh, the U.S. government, wanting all of their Egyptian artifacts back from all of their expeditions, and then saying, if you can't uh, return them, destroy them. Even in that time period was the, and when I say the Egyptian Brotherhood, I mean the Egyptian priesthood, that which most people don't even know exists. And interestingly enough, the best portrayal of that, that whole Egyptian, Egyptian uh, priesthood was, I think, in either the first or second Sherlock Holmes movie with Robert Downey Jr. When I saw that, I said, here you go, you guys. It's Hollywood, and I think I said that years ago when it came out. So it's very important that people understand the thread of history leads right to the very pages of our newspapers, the movies of our day, the headlines of uh, the Internet sites, and now we're, we're in a time where there's nothing that's going to be hidden. So, Derek... I'll turn it back over to you because I think it's important that people understand all these things are linked and synced by a central uh, theme, if you will, of snake worship. Uh, or, and I'm not just talking in the desert southwest. I'm talking worldwide or dragon worship or the sea creatures. Go ahead, sir. That's really critical to understanding because a lot of people, uh, you know, who have been to the Grand Canyon, the real names for all of the, if you will, pyramidal or almost uh, structures that look like the Sphinx were uh, Hopi terms. They were not anglicized or Egyptianized terms uh, that the National Park Service used. Now, I, I mentioned earlier, this is critical, everyone. When everybody talks about the great Smithsonian cover-up, I want to give you this. This is an exact quote. Prime Minister Nubar Pasha of Egypt was the first Prime Minister of Egypt and served his first term from January 1884 to June 1888. Prime Minister Pasha uh, uh, of Egypt contacted the U.S. Department of State and requested that all of the Egyptian artifacts found in the Grand Canyon be returned to Egypt. Now, here it is, Derek. Here it is, you, you know, uh, Doug and Joe. He also requested that no more information about Egyptians ever being the Grand Canyon be published by the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian archaeologists think that, and they, by the way, there's an unfinished uh, Egyptian pyramid in the Grand Canyon. It looks like the Saqqara uh, pyramid, or as a step pyramid, is a burial tomb because there's an entrance tunnel that is blocked a few feet inside the pyramid. But listen to this. The National Park Service will not allow the archaeologists to excavate any of the pyramids in the Grand Canyon. Now, Derek, I'm sure you get it, I get it. How does this relate to salvation? God is going to lead his people out of the area that's going to be destroyed. I don't know where that is, cities of refuge. But the, the Pharaoh was a type of the Antichrist that is yet to come. And interestingly enough, the final uh, element when the children of Israel left was, you know, obviously the idea that there is great judgment on Pharaoh, the Red Sea. Now, Derek uh, mentioned a word, catastrophism, and I'm going to be dealing with that at Branson. What if the true biblical narrative, and by the way, the book of Job has a lot to say as well as other Old Testament books about God's a catastrophic judgment upon a planet called Rahab. And Rahab was between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. And due to some laws in physics, they can calculate not only the size, but uh, again, the uh, amount, if you will, of gravitational pull that would have been necessary along with the plasma arc. And it goes to basically this. 
a planet of greater mass and greater electrical charge will destroy the planet of lesser mass and lesser electrical charge. The, the ancients were terrified of the skies. What I've found through all the years that I've been doing this is all the observatories, every place in the world, all of the astronomers who had the ancient knowledge passed down to them, Tom Horn's uh, trip to Mount Graham, everybody is looking for the skies. They're looking for the, uh, if you will, the testimony of past judgment, but the future judgment coming upon the earth, whether it's Apophis or whether it's other uh, uh, heavenly bodies. You know, here's the thing, Dirk. We talk about the planets, and, and everybody will deal or concern themselves uh, with, you know, Planet X, Gabriel's Fist, Lucifer's Hammer, uh, you know, the 10th planet, all these different names, but they avoid probably the greatest fingerprint of a catastrophic judgment on Lucifer, and you go into Ezekiel, the stones of fire, Hebrew idiom uh, for planets, the idea that each star was the abode of an angel, falling stars, or what, shooting stars, the, the purpose of all this stuff, of ancient history, uh, putting this into perspective is to show you the deception that's coming. And by the way, when you go into the Grand Canyon, I just flew over it months ago, and uh, you've got the names of, of some pretty famous landmarks. And remember, these were told to the first park rangers and the explorers. The Tower of Set, it's Setabrine, and it was named by the Hopi Indians. The Tower of Set was built in the Grand Canyon as a burial tomb for King Setabrine that came to the Grand Canyon, but King Setabrine died on a trip back to Shemau. All the Egyptians, now listen, all the Egyptian hieroglyphs said have eroded off the pyramid. The Set Pyramid has rectangular shape similar to the first pyramids in Egypt. Then you've got the Hopi Indians t talking about the most pyramidal structure that actually, I believe, was a sphinx before erosion and intentional destruction took place, is the Tower of Ra. And what's fascinating about the Tower of Ra is that you can actually see an entrance that when you look into the entrance with a high-powered lens, a telephoto, like a Canon 300, 400, you know, extremely high-resolution uh, lens with the, the sun in the right per, uh, correct position, it looks like somebody actually, Derek, went in there and, and uh, blocked it up and painted it white. But you can see mm. footpaths. And what a lot of people don't understand is, like, with aerial imagery and satellite, uh, the ability to take, and I'm not just talking about LIDAR, I'm talking about uh, infrared and ultraviolet. You can actually see old, if you will, paths, footpaths, or horse horse paths. And this is how so many of the lost cities in Africa and other places have been found. But when you line all these things up, as uh, you know, so many people have done it, Graham Hancock and others, that every single one of the pyramids or the supposed natural structures line up either with uh, Orion's belt or the Pleiades. And it, it's true not only in Egypt, it's true in the, in the desert southwest, it's true in Sardinia, it's true all over in Mexico. So by basically doing a regressive, stellar projection, you can get the idea when these, uh, 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 I'm sorry, monuments and cyclopean architecture going even back further than, you know, 2000 B.C. were installed. So even the, the story that people laugh about that, you know, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, I'll be presenting that in pretty graphic form. I have literally interviewed, Doug, and I've said this before, uh, guys who are on the, the military mission of the takeout of other giant G-I-A-N-T mummies from the Grand Canyon. And the thing is, they were there on multiple occasions, and Cliff Mahoudi, who we have on uh, the DVD, the uh, Holocaust of Giants. And by the way, let me put a pitch in for this. If you want to be brought up to speed and what's going to be happening in the future with the headlines of tomorrow, I would encourage you to get the Unholy Sea, uh, Gen 6 Productions, and you can go to truelegendsaseries.com, and more importantly, or in conjunction, the Holocaust of Giants. Because what we're going to show you unequivocally, and I know Tom's going to be talking about this, this isn't by coincidence. So if you're talking about the Tower of Set, you're talking about all the different, and they even have one called the Tower of Zoroaster. 
And Zoroaster mm-hmm. is a guy that was uh, a lot of people be- believe that his name was Joseph. You know, came had been from Joseph because he had a god that was higher in the heavens than the sun god named Ra. And, and that he knew what the dream meant. Uh, it's really important that people understand that uh, it's an Orwell statement, George Orwell, who was pretty uh, well connected to the inner uh, crew, that they who control the past basically write the future, control the future. I believe what God is doing is showing his people, just like he delivered Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt, when all the Pharaoh's armies, so will he deliver the people that are obedient and praying and trusting him. It was when the money failed that obviously uh, people just had to go. They had to flee Egypt because there was nothing left now except God's provision. God fed him with the manna, and I, I love this because it's true. When God feeds you, he knows what's nutritionally sound. I'm, con- I'm convinced, Derek, that God knew the nutritional supplemental value of manna. I am convinced that in one wonderful heavenly angel food wafer, uh, you didn't need 400 bottles of every amino acid vitamin. I'm not mocking it, but I would just say this. With manna's inherent creator, would come the nutrition that would be beyond description. Now, getting to quail, i.e., obviously, uh, when the children of Israel were unhappy with the manna, they wanted meat, and God sent them the meat. But unfortunately, people couldn't stomach the meat, and they started to vomit. It's kind of like the truth. People cannot handle the truth. Too much is, is, uh, forgive me, sometimes too little is too much for them to digest. Yes. I also want to say this, that, Joe, the reason, okay, the reason that the Smithsonian, and I wrote this in my book on True Legends, listen, unless you understand who set up the Smithsonian, James Smithson, who was the head of it, John Wesley Powell, John Wesley Powell even is in his own, in his own records talked about giant mummies and everything else, and the idea simply that everyone's got to get across and get through is that the history you've been taught is a total bloody uh, repulsive lie. And and I will say this, Derek, I believe that the forbidden fruit is now and will yield its ultimate harvest and the damnation of billions. The scripture, now, that's a powerful statement. I just, you know, I just got that at the moment. But the forbidden fruit, the same stuff that was offered to Adam and Eve, look at how many people have suffered under original sin, and look at the price the human race has paid. But more importantly, look at the price that God's Son, Jesus Christ, has paid to redeem us. And if you understand what it truly meant, if I understand, I get bits and pieces like most people do, what a wonderful, loving, glorious God that obviously, you know, was was wanting his family back because God used to walk with Adam in the cool of the day. Hey, any of us would take that be on a heartbeat. But the point being is is that the forbidden fruit is now yielding its ultimate harvest and damnation. Now, what is the quintessential goal of, of Google? What's the quintessential goal of total spy apparatus over the entire world? Doug, what's the, the final, at, at the end of the day, no matter what the technology, what is the word that is used to, to basically define it all. To define specifically what, Steve? I'm, I'm not the trying. Surveillance net. The, I'm uh, sorry. Oh, the surveillance. Uh, uh, yeah, um, well, the eye in the sky. Well, but it, uh, I'm. Well, yeah, you no, know, I'll make it easy. I'm sorry. Uh, pay attention, grasshopper. <laughs> uh, today, I say to you, you have two. You have two teachers. Both are trying to give left brain and right brain information that you need. <laughs> so pay attention, grasshopper. I'm just kidding. So anyway, the thing is, is that we're we're at we're at this uh, junction where the ultimate control is information. It's the, if you will, it's the devil's promise in the form of a lie being bought by the technocrats 
who are trying to live forever apart from God, claiming we will not have this man Jesus rule over us, and all of the things that Derek and myself and Dr. Lake and, and, and uh, L.A. Marzulli and all of us, Timothy Alberino, Anselm P. Rambla, all of us who are going to be at, the, at Branson, you're going to see a central theme in a central court. And guess what the good news is, everybody? This is what all you go, I don't know why they talk about this stuff. This has nothing to do with salvation. It has everything to do with salvation. If you're believing a lie and you're living in uh, the lack of knowledge, God's declaration of the will is his people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Remember this, the occultists, they smile, they smirk, they mock, they scorn, they scoff, and they know this stuff is true. It's just the Christians that should walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another in the light do not want to deal with reality because with reality brings responsibility, with responsibility brings ultimate accountability before the living God. So what we're doing, what Derek and I and others are doing, is trying to show you the tapestry. We're trying to put the thread that God has given us uh, individually, and now he's bringing it together collectively. And Derek, I'm going to turn it right back to you. I'm kind of interested in to see how God weaves this all together, because I think this, the tapestry that God is the tapestry of redemption, and it's going to set people free. It's going to empower people, because the days that we're coming into, it's impossible for the mind of humans to embrace it. But God's given us a little bit of the time, at a time, and revealing uh, much more than he's ever, in, excuse me, much more than he ever has in history. And that's what Derek, you and I, and all the men that are going to be there get to be, I guess you'd say, fingerprints on the creative and the redemptive purpose of Jesus Christ.